it's, uh, it's February, I can't believe it. And we're starting a new worship series, um, and uh, it's called Represent, which is about as cool and hip as I'll ever be. <laughs> Represent. <laughs> um, and basically what it's about is what does it mean to be the church outside these walls? What does it mean to be the church when we're not in worship, when we're not in this space? What does God call us to do and to be as the church in the world? And so I started here with um, the, the last part of the first chapter of John because um, we have a story of, that happens in the world. It happens in the marketplace, right? Um, people have had an experience of Jesus, and Jesus is walking around, and there's this, um, this invitation that happens. People point Jesus out. And, and bring people to Jesus. There's a pattern of invitation and following. And I know what you're thinking. I'm not called to bring people to Jesus, right? I mean, like, evangelism and anything like that seems a little creepy to me. Well, if you're a member of this church, I have some semi-bad news for you. Um, when we join the church, we make certain promises. We promise to support the church with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and something called witness. And um, witnessing has a certain stereotype to it. I'm from the Deep South, and so I speak witness. I understand that as a term. You're from the civilized mid-Atlantic states, so you may have a certain um, picture that comes to mind when you hear the word that might be, might be off-putting. So um, for many of us... Um, in, in the civilized mid-Atlantic, it's easier to invite a friend to almost anything else than something that happens at a church. Maybe that is because in America, we really think religion is one of the most personal things that there are for, for someone. Or maybe it's because we think before we even say the word church, we have to be the world's most eminent theologian. We have to have all the answers. We think the person's going to follow up with, well, tell me, when you take communion, does it become the body of Christ or the actual body? What's going on there? It may even be tainted by some experience you had where somebody tried to witness to you, and let's just say it was less than inviting. Um, folks that pass out tracts, uh, or knock on doors and open with the uh, exciting invitational question, if you were to die today, do you know how you would spend eternity? Now, it is important how you're going to spend eternity. But if that's what it means to witness, how many of us are really um, going to sign up to do that? And if that's what witnessing looks like, it really seems like... Um, I think of it like the gospel in reverse. Uh, the gospel is called that because it's good news. Gospel, good news. I think um, that sort of evangelism that I was talking about is the bad news of Christ. It's backwards. Um, it's not exactly something that's going to make people want to come here or want to meet our Jesus. So, we turn to the scriptures instead, and when I turn there, I see that talking about Jesus is anything but bad news. What I see are a bunch of people who've had some kind of encounter with Jesus, and they cannot keep it to themselves. I think we can learn a lot about what it means to be the church outside the church doors from this passage. Now, uh, the first thing I would say is that it looks pretty simple and basic to me. There's a pattern here of invitation and following. John the Baptist tells what he saw. He points to Jesus, the Lamb of God. That eminent theologian, John the Baptist, literally says, Look, Jesus! Two disciples follow Jesus and they say, Where are you staying? They don't have to pass a theological test at any point. Nobody whips out their discipline and starts looking stuff up. It doesn't happen. Jesus asked, what are you looking for? 
You're looking for something or you wouldn't be following me around. What are you looking for? And they say, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. That is an evangelism plan a mainline Methodist like myself could get behind. Nobody in this transaction has to be the Savior except for the Savior. Nobody has to have their life together first. Nobody has to have the perfect words. Nobody has to have the perfect haircut. You don't have to have your bank account together. You don't have to be the world's most perfect fill in the blank. Husband, wife, sister, brother, child. The words are very simple. Look. What are you looking for? Where are you staying? Come and see. John the Baptist simply points to Jesus. And here's your bonus bit of knowledge, because I'll try to make you get your money's worth. You went to the trouble of coming to church uh, in February, so I want to make sure. Here's your art history lesson. If you're ever in an art museum, and you're looking at a religious-ish painting, and there's a guy who inexplicably is pointing to somebody with a big halo, the pointer is John the Baptist. That's John the Baptist. He's, he's the witness. He prepares the way. He points to Jesus, his one job, if you will. And if you're looking at a painting and inexplicably, you know, I mean, it's John, he points to Jesus. You're welcome. <laughs> and then all the people have to do is get within spitting distance of Jesus. Okay? They, they, they get around him and then Jesus takes it from there. Once they come to know Jesus, very often, something happens in their life. And then they say, I probably need to go tell somebody about this. I'm going to go look for my friends. I'm going to tell them what happened to me. So John told two friends, and one of them turned out to be Peter's brother. So he went and found Peter and said, we found the Messiah. And then Jesus looks at him. They get in the same room, they look at each other, and the next thing you know, his name's Cephas. He's got a new name. So this pattern shows us uh, seeking and finding and seeing and being seen. Nice and simple. So, I always wonder, every single week, I sort of expect that I'm going to show up at 9.30 on Sunday and no one will be here. But yet, miracle of miracles, maybe not like during the beginning of the prelude, but like by the end of the announcements, <laughs> I look out at you and I say to myself, look at that, look at God. You are here for a reason. I don't know what that reason is, but you didn't come here by accident, right? You weren't looking for the Target store and missed. You didn't like come here thinking we sell toothpaste and now you're just horribly disappointed. Um, you're here for a reason. You're looking for something. What are you looking for? I bet it's Jesus, even if you don't always call it that. And I bet what brought you here, since you're not here by accident, someone maybe invited you. And when they did that, they didn't give you a treatise on Trinitarian theology. They didn't quote our discipline. They didn't cite any footnotes. Maybe something on our website sort of attracted you. You were like, look, they have children there. That's amazing. Hey, there's a joyful noise. My kid makes a lot of joyful noise. Wouldn't it be good if he could have a place you know, that he could learn to sing and learn that Jesus loves him. I'm going to just try it out. I'm going to come and see. I don't know if you realize this fully or not, but a lot of people that are unchurched, they, they don't think about Christianity in the best of terms. Maybe because they associate it with some negative experience they had. Like maybe that old eternity question. Or, or, or they had some abusive experience in the church. Some experience of the church where they heard the message, Jesus does not love you, you are not welcome here. So part of what I love about being a follower of Jesus and being a member of this church and being a pastor is that together we get to show people something else. 
we get to put Jesus and people in the same room and let Jesus take it from there. We, we get to put Jesus and people in the same room and let them get a good long look at each other. We get to disabuse people of the notion that Jesus does not love them. We get to remind folks that Jesus does not need our permission to love us. That is not how grace works. And we get to show them a way of life and a source of meaning for that life. We get to show them a church and a life that lifts up the new world that Jesus Christ initiated. A kingdom of God sort of place where the poor are blessed and people who mourn are comforted and the peacemakers inherit the kingdom. Someone probably invited you to come and see and then you followed. We may not have it all figured out. But for many of us, we have a sneaking suspicion that in that invitation, God called us out of something and into something. God called us out of a life that was just lived for our own self and into a life where we know that we are children of God, gifted, called to love and serve others. First Peter puts it this way. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. And why? In order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So there are a lot of people... Wondering, can anything good come from Nazareth? Maybe a few wondering, can anything good come from that crazy church up there? And the good news is, we don't have to convert. The Holy Spirit does that. You know, I don't do anything magical with the elements. Pour out your Holy Spirit and take it from there, God. God does all the good stuff. We don't have to convert or even convince in a conventional way. All we do is we say, come and see. And we let Jesus and them lock eyes for a minute. You know, and it could happen at the day of service. It could happen in your book club. It could happen on a mission trip. It could happen in worship. And then you'd be amazed to see what happens next. What can you invite them to come and see? Well, this church has umpteen 11 million events. If an invitation to worship is hard to do, I suspect it's easy to invite someone to a free furlough fellowship dinner. Or um, when we did the sale to benefit Hope Works against domestic violence, um, come buy a cool scarf or pair of earrings. Hello. And that can be an opening for somebody to find out, you know, I came for the food. And uh, I was intrigued. They weren't horrible. They're pretty normal. I talked to somebody I have a lot in common with. You know, they prayed for me. And uh, so I'm going to check them out again. I don't know what I believe about the Trinity or anything. But I'll just go back. And before you know it, a relationship has begun. Before you know it, they're going to Bible study. They're helping in the nursery. They're giving their third grader a Bible. And they couldn't even tell you how it happened. Come and see. It's a simple thing. You can say, come check out our crazy new pastor. For the next eight months, that is what I shall be known as. Because until you've done everything once, you're the new pastor, baby. I hate to tell you. Right? A whole year. And here's another secret I bet you didn't know. Glenmar is not just another cool club to belong to. If all you want is a pair of earrings, I know where to shop. If all you want is a bake sale or a craft fair or some taco salad, like you can get that anywhere. The difference here though is, always under, in, and through everything we do, the food, the earrings, the retreats, the crazy games we play at youth group, um, there is Jesus Christ 
in and through all that we do, offering a new way of living in the world. So you may come for the food and end up staying because you got a glimpse of Jesus when you least expected it. And it's not just about inviting people to come here, because as it turns out, the Holy Spirit does not just exist in the Spirit Center and nowhere else. We are called to be the hands and feet of Christ, wait for it, everywhere we go. Amazing. If you are baptized, you are a child of God, and you are a part of the family business, the body of Christ. And our business is to love and lift up, to be repairers of the breach, healers of the broken, lovers of the unlovable. You've been called to faith and hope and love. And part of being in the family business is you really can't keep it too much of a secret. You'd be a terrible entrepreneur if you started a business and never told anybody about it. And this is true even in a big church. I was talking with somebody this week. I said, you know, Glenmar is just big enough. I bet there are people who come to worship here who think that we don't need them. That's crazy. God needs all of us, needs all of our gifts, needs all of us to, do, uh, to be the body of Christ in the world. Now, I know what you're thinking. When I look at my paycheck, it does not say God Incorporated. I've checked. It doesn't say um, Christ's body, hands and feet division. When I get my direct deposit slip, there's not a little thank you note. Mandy, way to be the left tonsil in the body of Christ. Keep going. I know what it says. It says U.S. government. It says county school system. It says social security. Or it says uh, insufficient funds. I get it. But I'm saying to you, don't be fooled. Whoever it is that signs your paycheck... You're really working for Jesus out in the world. You're in God's family business, sent to carry it out at all the crazy places that God sends us. It's like a covert Occupy Wall Street arrangement. I I just like the verb occupy, okay? I think that speaks to me. We, We don't so much go to work, we occupy it on behalf of Christ. Yeah. I think that represent. (laughs) So here's some homework for you. A mission if you choose to accept it, okay? Make a list. And yes, you can use your iPod pad, all your things. Make a list of all of your social circles. I bet you know a lot of people your Facebook, your Twitgram, your Insta, Twitter, all of that. What are they looking for? How could Glenmar be a blessing to them? Who can you invite to come and see? My, my illustration of what it's like to be God's um, often unwilling representative in the world is the story that I told in my pastor's ponderings. Every Friday, you get a little pastor's ponderings from me. Sometimes they're they're pretty good. Sometimes they're totally not. And you'll know what kind of week I've had, depending. But um, this week, I told this story in the pastor's ponderings, and I wasn't going to tell it in the sermon until I discovered my husband is not subscribed to pastor's ponderings. And I was like, dude, way to be supportive. But it clued me in that maybe not all of you are subscribed So I'll tell you this story. So I wasn't thinking about being God's representative in the world, hands and feet of Christ. I was thinking, oh man, i got to write that sermon. It happens, right? So I put on some sermon writing clothes. Like, 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 please don't let church people see me clothes. Baggy sweatpants, sweatshirt. I was heading off to the Panera. I was on my way to Panera, and something in my spirit that I thought was just straight procrastination, because it happens, said, you know what you need to do before you sit down to write that sermon? You need your flu shot, because it's dangerous out there. 
why don't you stop over at the CVS and get that flu shot, which is way more important than the sermon that you don't want to write right now. So I go to the CVS, I end up in the line for my flu shot, and ahead of me in the line is a young mother, and she's buying assorted stuff, and the first thing I notice is she's buying a Snickers bar. And like one of these is not like the others. It's like all baby stuff and a Snickers bar. So I went, huh, I'm, you're not you when you're hungry. And then I looked at her, and I realized that she had been crying. And I wish I could tell you my first thought was, hooray, an evangelism opportunity. I looked down at my baggy sweatpants. I was in a grumpy mood. It was raining. It was cold. My first thought was, oh, Jesus wants me to talk to her. I'm going to have to talk to her because Jesus wants me to. And Jesus said, yes. <laughs> so I summon all my knowledge of United Methodist polity and, and, and Eucharistic theology and that thing about the Trinity. I summoned it all up and I go, are you okay? You're welcome. And she goes, no, actually I'm not. So then I say, would you like to talk about it? And when she looks at me like I might be a threat to her, I say, look, I'm a pastor, but I'm like the good kind. <laughs> so if you want to talk, we can talk. So we sat in the little chairs in the, where you wait for your flu thing. And she says, look, um, my mother died. And they found her this morning. And my kid has an ear infection. And I've got to go deal with something like identifying her. Like, it's horrible. She outlined this horrible day. And she said, and I didn't shower and I didn't have breakfast. Hence the Snickers bar. And so we just talked. We talked about her mom the kind of person she was. And what a great mom this woman clearly is bringing her kid to the CVS, right? So I say, like, first, I really hope that you can have a good breakfast. Like, eat the Snickers bar, but I just hope that you can have a good breakfast and that you can be gentle with yourself. And can I pray for you? And what's your name? Because I can take it back to my crazy church because we got people who pray over there. Would that be all right? That's what it is to be the body of Christ in the world. That what do, what do we expect of you? What do I expect of you? That. To be the hands and feet of Christ wherever you are. To see the people outside these walls as people who might need a blessing from this church. Most of us mainline Methodists, and I am one my whole life, we, we say this to ourselves. I never have to say the word God or Jesus. I never have to invite anybody anywhere because I'm just going to live like Jesus, which to mainline Methodist means I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to be a good person in the world, and people will just look at me and they'll go, what a good person. I bet she's a United Methodist pastor. I'm going to ask what church she works at. That is true to a point. But if all we do is try to live a Jesus life and we never offer Jesus to others, guess what happens? People look at us and they say, they're very nice. They do lots of great things. I heard they packaged 105,000 meals. But you know what? I could never do that. They're good, but they're not like me. I'll never have what they have. But if we say, I belong to this crazy church. We packed 105,000 meals. I didn't know I could do that. They made it easy. Come and see. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Each of us has a story of the difference Jesus has made in our lives. And it may not be dramatic, okay? And it may not be the same as everybody else's story. But it is a story we're called to share. If you don't know what your story is, I have two questions for you. One, why in the world would you come to church instead of staying home and watching CBS Sunday Morning, which is a great television show? Why are you here? That's question one. You, you could be home cleaning the kitchen, which I know doesn't sound great, but in the end you have a clean kitchen. Why are you here? Number one. Number two, why do you come to this church and not all the other churches out there? 
I bet you pass at least one other church on your way here. Why would you pick this one? You have a reason. It could be because my kid is in the joyful noise group. It could be I love the choir. It could be this church helps me show the love of Jesus in mission. Whatever it is, that is your testimony. Each of us can see God at work in another person's life. And we can see it in our own life too. We're not asked to share that which we don't already have. We're not asked to witness somebody else's story. We're only called to say what we have experienced and then say, come and see. So it's not an invitation to a free furlough fellowship dinner and nothing else. It's also an invitation to a new life. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of a biggish church that calls itself Methodist in this messy world that we're called? Can anything good come out of there? Come and see. And if while you're here, you get a glimpse of Jesus, go and tell somebody. Amen.